Good evening. This is Pastor Bill with Truth Triumphant Ministries. We're currently doing a series called Is There Not a Cause? Based on the comments that David made to his older brother Eliab, his eldest brother, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. David was angry over what was going on. Goliath was butchering God's people and David wanted to see action. He wanted to see Goliath go down. And so when Eliab heard what David was saying, he got upset with David, not with himself and the rest of Israel, but with David. And David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? And um, so we're going to continue on. This is going to be part six. And to the subtitle for this message today is um, This Day This Scripture is Fulfilled in Your Ears. Before we continue on further, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for your words that still shine as a light and a dark place. We pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, for the strength that only the Holy Spirit can give uh, to bless our time here together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, it's fascinating that when Jesus was preaching in the synagogue in Nazareth in um, probably around 28 AD, Jesus quoted from Isaiah chapter 61, and uh, he declared these words. I, it's Isaiah, Luke chapter 4. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, sat down, the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. You know, the Desire of Ages says that as Jesus read those words, and then he began to comment on them. People were shouting, Amen, preach it, brother, all over the synagogue there in Nazareth. But then in verse 21, Jesus stated something that shook them to the core. It says, He began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. When Jesus declared that Isaiah 61 applied, that he was the Messiah, that the Holy Spirit was leading him, and that the people he was speaking to were captives to, to sin, that they were blind to the attacks of the devil, that was it. And when he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, they couldn't handle it. So it's one thing, friend, to, to speak a Bible passage or a spirit of prophecy quote. But when you bring it down to today and show its fulfillment today, then, there's, then people get angry. Well, in our series... And I don't know how many, how much longer we're going to be able to have series like this. 
But in our series, Is There Not a Cause? We have been looking at various statements from the Spirit of Prophecy, the Catholic procession in that volume one of the uh, testimonies. We looked in first selected messages, pages 204 and 205. Uh, we looked at um, Review and Herald, March 18, 1884. We looked at Great Controversy, page 608. So we've looked at different passages showing their fulfillment, friends, today as we speak. And we're going to continue on in that vein today. And we're going to look at a passage where Ellen White talks about what's going on today and uh, we're going to see if it doesn't have fulfillment for us. Prophets and Kings, page 187 and 188. It says, God will not break his covenant nor alter the thing that has gone out of his lips. His word will stand fast forever as unalterable as his throne. At the judgment, this covenant will be brought forth plainly written with the finger of God. And the world will be arraigned before the bar of infinite justice to receive sentence. Today, as in the days of Elijah, the line of demarcation between God's commandment-keeping people and the worshipers of false gods is clearly drawn. Friend, it's, it's getting clearer and clearer because Seventh-day Adventists are making firmer and firmer decisions either for God and His truth or against God and His truth. I'm watching it with people that will call the ministry. They'll want to discuss various things with me. And um, people are taking very hard positions, friend, either for God and His truth or against God and His truth. And the shaking is, is just about over, friends. It's just about over. The line of demarcation between those who will follow what God says and those who won't is becoming very, very clear. How long halt ye between two opinions, Elijah cried. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 1 Kings 18.21 The message for today is Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. It's going to be fascinating, friends, because the messages that we have been given as a people, we're denying them today by our actions. We're denying them by our involvement in ecumenism, in our support of the various cops, 25, 26, 27, and now this year, COP 28, where the climate change agenda continues to be promoted, just as Great Controversy 589 and 590 told us it would, where the weather and the destruction of society, of our physical earth, would become an issue in light of a Sunday law. And Seventh-day Adventists are supporting that. ADRA uh, supported the recent uh, climate change agenda out of COP27, I believe it was. So the denomination is supporting all these things. And Pope Francis has claimed very clearly that the climate change agenda is his um, loud message to the world. So what will we do, friends, as God's professed people, Will we embrace the loud message of Pope Francis? Or will we hold on to the loud cry of the third angel's message? 
Right now, Seventh-day Adventists may profess to believe that message, but they're certainly living a far different message in their seeking to unify with Pope Francis and the climate change agenda. And we go on. Great uh, Prophets and Kings, page 188. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. You know, friend, it's, it's fascinating that Ellen White uses the term, the, a test. The test will come. And in Ellen White's mind, the test, uh, in Great Controversy, page 608, that we read about when she says, and when the test is brought, and here in Prophets and Kings, page 188, the test, of course, is Sunday. And I know in the Desire of Ages, in the chapter called The Crisis in Galilee, Ellen White clearly talks about the fact that, or maybe it's the chapter A Night on the Lake, just prior to the crisis in Galilee, where Peter is walking on the water, and how Ellen White describes the importance of the daily tests that we experience, the daily struggles and battles that we're going through, and how desperately, friends, we need to cling to Christ's hand to be overcomers so that when the great test comes, we will be ready to meet it in the power of Jesus Christ. So Ellen White again describes, the time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The observance of the false Sabbath will be urged upon us. The contest will be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. So friends, how important it is today that if the Lord is calling us on some issue in our lives and we're saying no to the Lord Jesus, Oh, friends, say yes to him today. Say, yes, Lord, I, I will surrender to you, and, and I will give my life to you, and you lead and guide me in every way in my life. And even that secret thing, friends, that secret sin, we must give it away to the Lord today, lest... If we're yielding step by step to what the world says is okay, and we're conforming to the worldly customs, we will then yield to the powers that be. At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. Oh, friends, the gold will be separated from the dross. Now, friends, you know, I was listening here just briefly last evening to a sermon of Ted Wilson in which he, he made the comment, he said, that he thought the shaking was beginning. And friends, the shaking isn't beginning. It's just about over. Um, <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Friends, that's why it's so critical that we're making solid choices, that we're not yielding to worldly customs and imbibing conformity to the world. The gold will be separated from the dross. 
True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Oh my friends, what a scary thought. Those who we hold up and we say, oh, he's a great speaker. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Friends, we've got to have our eyes wide open. No matter who you're listening to, no matter where the messages are coming from that you listen to, friends, you've got to compare what they're saying with the Bible and with Ellen White. And if it doesn't line up, friends, you've got, you've got to follow the truth as it is in Jesus as it is in his words. Friends, if you're hearing a message from Truth Triumphant, whoever the person, whoever the speaker is, be it me, be it Paul Prano or Cody Mori, friends, if you can't line it up with what you know is true, research it out. Find out what is true. And follow that which is true, friends. Don't accept anything from anybody, friends. But compare and test it. Test it, friends. But it says that many that we have admired for their brilliance will go out into darkness. And of course, this is right in line with what Great Controversy 608 tells us. That men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth will use their talents to deceive and mislead souls. So friends, be careful today. If you're hearing a message that's deceptive, a message that's a lie, Friends, resist it, reject it, protest against it. And by all means, don't support it. You know, I, I think back to the Sabbath school quarterly of a number of months ago that was done on the three cosmic messages of Revelation 14, done by Mark Finley. And in there, as he discussed the second angel's message, for the entire week on Babylon Fallen, he never once mentioned who Babylon Fallen was. I saw a pamphlet that was being put out by 3ABN at a camp meeting that I was at in Arkansas. It was given to me to peruse to tell them what I thought of it. Well, I immediately went to the second angel's message. And never once in that discussion on the second angel's message was apostate Protestantism referred to. And friends, I look at that and I say, if, if we can't tell the truth now, what are we going to do then? What are we going to do when the pressure is on? Friends, many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. You know, so often people look and say, well, you know, Bill, you, you speak against this guy and that guy. Friends, analyze what they've said. Is it true? Is it not true? If it's true, oppose me. Disagree with me. But if it isn't true, then protest. Protest with me, friends. You know, I think of the 
following the death of Billy Graham and two well-known Adventist ministers who I think many Seventh-day Adventists have admired for their brilliance, for them being light bearers. Doug Batchelor, Steve Wahlberg of Whitehorse Media. Friends, both those uh, both of those Adventist ministers who were trying to tell people that Billy Graham is not in heaven and that was a good thing that they were trying to do but friends I was horrified to hear them tell the world that Billy Graham will someday be in heaven when friends the overwhelming evidence is that Billy Graham compromised gave in to the papacy and became an ecumenical spokesman for the Vatican. Billy Graham was a dear friend of John Paul II. When Billy Graham received a, a uh, honorary doctorate from Belmont College, a Catholic institution, Billy Graham said the same gospel that is the foundation of this school is the same gospel I preached. And Doug Batchelor and Steve Wahlberg could say Billy Graham will be in heaven? Friends, why would they say something like that when the evidence is overwhelming? Why would 3ABN, why would... Mark Finley not expose who Babylon fallen is. Why are they denying clear cut truth for this time? Many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Friends, be very careful who you're listening to and what they're saying. Make sure that what you're hearing, you can back up, friends. And if you can't, then you better go back and study it out for yourself. Those who have assumed the ornaments of the sanctuary, but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness, will then appear in the shame of their own nakedness. Oh, friends, we must be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. This is the message to the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. The white raiment, which Ellen White in Christ Object Lessons, right around page 316, 317, the chapter called Without a Wedding Garment. Ellen White says that robe of righteousness is perfect obedience to the law of God. So the righteousness of Christ, it's not something to cloak sin, friends. It never has been and it never will be. The righteousness of Christ is given to us to enable us to obey. May God help you, friends. May God help me that we might be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That we will stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. That we will fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. May God bless you, friend, and strengthen you to pass that final test. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, 
Thank you for the light from the spirit of prophecy. And we see what she has written, that this day it is being fulfilled in our ears. Bless and strengthen us, Lord, to walk in your laws. Forgive us where we have failed you, where we have hurt you, where we have arrogantly gone our way instead of your way. Empower us today to walk in your steps, in obedience to your law. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.